to make a brief historical inquiry based on a few comments in a recent live stream from Acadiana Augustinian regarding Baptists and sacraments. We'll play the clip, detail what we're not responding to, and then make our inquiry. Could I offer to you that Tertullian held beliefs that would be rejected in any Baptist church today? A treatise on our sacrament of water, so there's strike number one, because for the Baptist it wouldn't be a sacrament, it'd be an ordinance, by which the sins of our earlier, bl earlier blindness are washed away and we are released for eternal life will not be superfluous, taking away the death by washing away of sins. The guilt being removed, the penalty, of course, is also removed. Baptism itself is a corporal act by which we are plunged into the water, while its effect is spiritual, in that we are freed from our sins. Okay, my Baptist friends, I'll grant you he says plunged. So we'll just assume, even though I don't think this is what Tertullian is saying, there are those scholars, plenty of them, that would tend to agree with uh, this not being about immersion. But let's say he is talking about it, because you will see plunge, and you will say, aha, that has to mean immersion. Okay, let's say it does. He's calling it a sacrament. No Baptist calls the, holy, the act of holy baptism a sacrament. And certainly no Baptist would say your blindness is washed away, you're released for eternal life, taking away death. No, for you as a Baptist, this is merely a, a, an act of profession of faith upon the time that the penitent person or repentant person, however you prefer the language, would receive Christ and thus make the right confession, Jesus Christ is God, at which point he should be admitted not to the sacrament, which is a means of grace, but the baptismal ordinance and only and exclusively by dipping, plunging, or immersion. My dear friends, my Baptist friends, if you've been told that Tertullian was a Baptist, even if he was, this is not language that you or any general immersionist like a charismatic could ever use. First, Tertullian's specific beliefs regarding the effect and mode of baptism don't concern us here. However, it is true that Tertullian should not be labeled a Baptist. Second, whether Baptists today refer to baptism as a sacrament does not concern us. Though we could quibble, this seems nearly universally true on the face of it, based on the sheer number of those who identify themselves as Baptist. Third, this isn't a polemic against other views of baptism. Finally, we're not going to try to make Baptist views appear conformable to Anglican ones or Lutheran ones, etc. Such an attempt would be foolhardy. Now for points to consider. First, what is the relevance of sacrament versus ordinance among Baptists? Second, what are some historic uses of the word sacrament amongst Baptists? Third, was baptism viewed as merely an act of profession of faith, obedience to a command? To the first question, we'll rely on James Renahan's comments on the Second London Baptist Confession from To the Judicious and Impartial Reader from Chapter 28 of Baptism and the Lord's Supper beginning on page 537. There is a fundamental mistake many make when noting that the word ordinance is employed in the Second London Confession, chapters 28 through 30, rather than the common post-Reformation term sacrament. They assume that this choice entailed a rejection of sacrament and a preference for ordinance, thus establishing a Zwinglian trajectory in subsequent Baptist circles. This is a false deduction. The term sacrament and its cognates, exempli gratia sacramental, regularly appear in particular Baptist literature without any indication that the word was controversial or inappropriate for a description of their confessional theology. More sparingly excerpting Renahan beginning on page 538, in their debates with various pedo-baptists, these confessional baptistic congregationalists emphasize the nature of baptism in the Lord's Supper as positive commands, an accent fundamental to the argument of their position. In seven different ways, this paragraph places baptism in the Lord's Supper into the realm of command. Since baptism and the Supper are appointments of Jesus Christ in His New Covenant, they must be defined by the New Covenant Scriptures. It is inappropriate to define a New Covenant ordinance by primary reference to the Old Covenant Scriptures. From page 540, the Baptists used the word ordinance in a more general sense to speak of the means of grace. It focused on the divine origination of these things, an important part of the Baptist polemic against the pedo-Baptists. For them, the notion that baptism and the Lord's Supper are ordinances of positive and sovereign institution, appointed by the Lord Jesus, the only lawgiver, to be continued in his church to the end of the world, was fundamental to their polemic. It seems that the use of this specific term has more to do with the nature of the argument for credo-baptism and defense against pedo-baptism than it does with any objection to the use of sacrament. To our second question, we'll examine some documents and writings from general and particular Baptists using the word sacrament. First, John Smith's short confession from 1610. Smith's views quickly developed when he was in his early 50s. In the span of some six years, he apparently left the Church of England, became a Baptist, baptized himself, became a Mennonite, then died in 1612. Nevertheless, at the late Baptist stage, the short confession says the following, Christ has preached the promised glad tidings, appointed and ordained the sacraments, the offices, and ministries by God thereto destinated. Christ teaches, comforts, strengthens, and baptizes us with the Holy Ghost, His heavenly gifts, and fiery victims, and keeps His spiritual supper with a faithful soul, making it partaker of the life-giving food and drink of the soul, the fruit, 
virtue and worth of his merits obtained upon the cross, the only and necessary good signified in the sacraments. In this holy church, God has ordained the ministers of the gospel, the doctrines of the holy word, the use of the holy sacraments, the oversight of the poor, and the ministers of the same offices. There are two sacraments appointed by Christ in his holy church, the administration whereof he has assigned to the ministry of teaching, namely, the holy baptism and the holy supper. For a more developed statement, there's an orthodox creed from 1679. The 27th article of baptism and the Lord's Supper immediately calls them sacraments. In the 28th article, after speaking of immersion, it says this being necessary to the due administration of this holy sacrament. In the 30th article of the Catholic Church as visible, two of the marks which show a congregation to be part of the one Catholic Church are where the word of God is rightly preached and the sacraments truly administered. In the 33rd article on the Lord's Supper, it does not call it a sacrament, having already done so six articles previously. On the particular Baptist side, both the 1644 and 1689 confessions only use ordinance, as noted before regarding the latter. However, the term is still used. Hercules Collins' An Orthodox Catechism from 1680 has a section of the sacraments, starting page 25 regarding baptism and the Lord's Supper, referring to them as sacraments throughout. He likewise uses it answering, How is the kingdom of heaven opened and shut by ecclesiastical discipline? If neither, then they obey the church's admonition and are by the same church kept from the sacrament. Finally, answering, What are we taught by the fourth commandment? He says the Lord's day is to be spent in private and public devotion as hearing the word diligently, practicing the gospel sacraments zealously. In his A Discourse of the Covenants, Nehemiah Cox argues, Now that such a promise of reward was given to Adam, and indeed employed in the combination of death in case of disobedience, may be concluded, three, from the sacramental use of that tree in the midst of the Garden of Eden, which was called the Tree of Life, because instituted of God for a sign and pledge of that eternal life, which Adam should have obtained by his own personal and perfect obedience to the law of God, had he continued therein. Later, after having pointed out the ark was shaped like a coffin and had the resemblance of a burial by entering into it, he says, in which respect the apostle Peter makes baptism to be the antitype to the ark, and thus was the ark an extraordinary sacrament or prefiguration of the church's redemption and salvation by the death and resurrection of Christ. In A Sober Discourse of Right to Church Communion, William Kiffin says on page 23, do the former scriptures institute the supper and command its observation? The latter do as well institute baptism and command its constant observation. The very same sanction, the same spirit, with equal authority establishes both, giving baptism precedency in order of time as being the sacrament of the spiritual birth and the other of spiritual nourishment and growth. And surely there is as much need of being newborn as being spiritually fed, that being of absolute necessity with respect to priority in order to this. On the very title page of a 1689 book, Gold Refined, or Baptism in Its Primitive Purity, Benjamin Keach notes that believers are the only true subjects of that holy sacrament, and refers to both baptism and the Lord's Supper as sacraments throughout the work. Finally, to our third question. An Orthodox creed says baptism is to be unto the party baptized, a sign of our entrance into the covenant of grace, and ingrafting into Christ, and into the body of Christ, and of remission of sins in the blood of Christ, and of fellowship with Christ in his death and resurrection, and of our living or rising to newness of life. In very similar wording, the 1689 says it is to be unto the party baptized, a sign of his fellowship with him in his death and resurrection, of his being engrafted into him, of remission of sins, and of giving up into God through Jesus Christ to live and walk in newness of life. Returning to Renahan, he says, This sign is intended by Christ for the spiritual benefit of the one professing faith in Christ. It signifies four truths. First, it is a sign of his fellowship with him in his death and resurrection. Those baptized receive a sign of fellowship with Christ in their baptism. Baptism denotes being engrafted into him. John Ball wrote, Everyone that believeth is born of God. He that is engrafted into Christ by faith is a new creature and made partaker of the divine nature. If we be engrafted into the similitude of Christ's resurrection, we must express by our actions the power and likeness of Christ's resurrection, which is done when we walk in all pleasing before God and set our affections upon things above. And this, as it is commanded on God's part, so it is sealed on our part in baptism. For a believer, baptism signifies this. It serves as a tangible reminder of union with the Savior. Baptism's third symbol of remission of sins should bring to mind the cleansing of sin received by faith, and the fourth, of his giving up unto God through Jesus Christ to live and walk in newness of life, makes the act of baptism a demarcation point in the life of the person baptized. It represents new life and serves as a reminder of the necessity to pursue holiness. Giving up is a present tense form and identifies baptism as the moment of commitment to the Lordship of Christ and the intention to walk in newness of life.
While differing on other aspects, this comports with the traditional Augustinian definition, a sacrament is a visible sign of an invisible grace. We'll continue with more historical materials, but I think it has been sufficiently shown that Baptists were not averse to using the word sacrament, doing so in their confessions, catechisms, and polemical writings, nor did they view baptism as a mere act of obedience or only an outward profession. It would benefit Baptists of all varieties to revisit the earlier materials of their tradition. After some 300 years of attacks from rationalism, enthusiasm, liberalism, etc., let us not eschew more of our past in search of some new, new measure, or compromise to gain some perceived favor with a world desperately seeking to throw off every trace of God's order from its sight and memory. Returning to Givens, A Sober Discourse of Right to Church Communion, on page 25 he cites John 6.54, Mark 16.16, and 1 Peter 3.21 and writes, As the supper is a spiritual participation of the body and blood of Christ by faith, and so not merely by the work done, is a means of salvation, so baptism signs and seals our salvation to us, which lies in justification and discharge of sin, etc. To conclude, the ends and uses of baptism being one, to represent to the eye and understanding by a visible sign or figure what hath been preached to the ear and heart, two, to witness repentance, three, to evidence regeneration, called in allusion to it the washing of regeneration, a being born of the water and spirit, and four, a symbol of our dying unto sin and living again to Christian newness of life. For as regeneration is the first work of God upon the soul in order to the exercise of the graces of Christ given, so hath he appointed baptism as that which is the first ordinance to be practiced, which doth more particularly than any other ordinance in the signification of it hold out and visibly represent our new birth, and therefore is called the baptism of repentance. Suitable hereunto does that learned and eminent divine Mr. Daniel Rogers express himself. Baptism, then, is the first sacrament of the gospel, consisting of water, which is sacramentally Christ, or whereby water duly applied, not only the presented part is made a member of the visible church, but also sealed up to an invisible union with Christ, and thereby interest in all those benefits of his which concern the being of regeneration. By calling it the first sacrament, I point at the presidency and order of baptism, the which all those names or baptism both in scripture and elsewhere do approve. It's the seed of the church, as the other is of food. It issued first out of the side of our Lord Jesus upon the cross, it's the creating instrument of God to produce and form the Lord Jesus to a new creature and to regeneration in the soul. It's called our union with Christ, our marriage ring, our military presmony, our matriculation, cognizance, and character of Christ, our implanting or engrafting into him and his body, our ship, our ark, our Red Sea, our putting on of Christ. For as all those go before our nourishment, communion, cohabitation, service, fruits, manna, or food from heaven, so this sacrament must go before the other. Breeding, begetting, and bringing out of the womb doth not more naturally go before the feeding of the infant by the mother's breasts than this womb of the youth of the church goes before the milk thereof. The church being no dry nurse, but a mother of her own, the sons and daughters of her own womb. Let all who desire to taste of the sealing power of the second sacrament to nourish them as saints, first prove the sealing power of the former sacrament to beget and make you saints. And a little after, Beware, lest the Lord be forward with them that fight against the God of order, lest instead of finding nourishment before breeding, as they rob God of his order, so they meet with wrath and judgment before mercy and salvation. Yet lest God accurse their single emptiness of Christ with such a double barrenness as will admit no conception or birth. And very pathetically, page 73, after he hath showed that Christ hath joined water with a kind of equal necessity with himself, Mark 16, 16, John 3, 5, subjoins, Shall not he who despises water, appointed to such an inseparable holy end, despise the ordainer of water? Shall we take his name in vain, by slighting that by which he makes himself, and the power of his word and spirit, manifest to beget the soul to him, and be holden guiltless? When Christ hath put both in one, shall we dare to say the one is strong, the other is base? Shall we slight it, slack our haste to it, our holy preparing of ourselves to it, our abiding at it, our offering up prayers for blessing it, are making it the joint object of our humiliation, faith, reverence, and thanks? Far be it from us, so to abhor that popish, hyperbolical esteem of it, and the merit of the work wrought of it, that we run into another riot to disesteem it. Doubtless he that cares not for Christ in the word, Christ in the promise, Christ in the minister, Christ in the water, Christ in the bread and wine, Christ sacramental, cares as little for Christ God, Christ flesh, Christ Emmanuel. By these he comes near, and he that despiseth you despiseth me, and him that sent me. Beware we of such contempt, 
even in the secretest of our thoughts and affections, and let Christ in the water be honored as Christ, for that sweet union and fruit which he brings to poor souls thereby. If Jordan be precious when God will use it, for the angels healing by it, much more this. Page 81. The Lord's scope in baptism is an inward grace, but this general privilege is to all equal, viz. a badge of an outward member, distinction from the common route of the world, out of the pale of the church. The Lord appointed circumcision as a seal of the righteousness of faith chiefly, yet as an overplus, he allowed it to be the differencer of all other nations from the Jews. It was a fence and wall of separation from them in all their converse. So is baptism now a mark or badge of external communion, whereby the Lord settles a right upon the person to his ordinances, that he may comfortably use them as his own privilege and wait for the inward prerogative of saints by them. And yet this, as much as men boast of it, is but a shell in respect of the other. So far he. The learned expositor gives his sense of this place thus. The answer of a good conscience is here attributed to Christ's resurrection as the thing signified and represented in baptism, and as the cause of that answer of a good conscience, even baptism, saith he, doth now save us as being the ordinance that seals up salvation, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh or the washing of the outward man, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Christ from the dead. To open this, saith he, our consciences are that principle within us, which are the seat of the guilt of all the sins of the whole man, unto whose court they all come to accuse us, as unto God's deputy, which conscience is called good or evil, as the state of the man is. Now in baptism, forgiveness and justification being sealed up to a believer's faith and conscience under that lively representation of his communion with Christ in his resurrection, hence this is made the fruit of baptism, that the good conscience of a believer sealed up in baptism hath wherewithal from thence to answer all accusations of sin that can or do at any time come in upon him, and is, as it is here added by virtue of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, namely in this respect, that his communion with Christ in his resurrection hath been represented in his baptism as the ground of his faith, and of that answer unto all accusations. To conclude this head, as baptism is not to be repeated, because it is the sacrament of regeneration, initiation, and incorporation, which are not capable of reiteration, so neither can the seal and sign thereof. Baptism was of old, and not without reason, called the gate of sacraments, and is to keep that name and nature still, viz., to be the first and primitive ordinance. Returning to Hercules Collins and Orthodox Catechism, he says the sacraments are sacred signs and seals set before our eyes and ordained of God for this cause, that he may declare and seal by them the promise of his gospel unto us, to wit, that he giveth freely remission of sins and life everlasting, not only to his all in general, but to everyone in particular that believeth, for that only sacrifice of Christ which he accomplished upon the cross. Next, do not then both the word and sacraments tend to that end, as to lead our faith unto the sacrifice of Christ finished on the cross as to the only ground of our salvation? It is even so, for the Holy Ghost teacheth us by the gospel, and assureth us by the sacraments, that the salvation of all of us standeth in the only sacrifice of Christ offered for us upon the cross. Several later, how art thou admonished and assured in baptism that thou art partaker of the only sacrifice of Christ? Because Christ commanded the outward washing of water, adjoining this promise thereunto, that I am no less assuredly washed by his blood and spirit from the uncleanness of my soul, that is, from all my sins, than I am washed outwardly with water, whereby all the filthiness of the body useth to be purged. And where does Christ promise us that he will as certainly wash us with his blood and spirit as we are washed with the water of baptism? In the institution of baptism, the words were over these, Go, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He that shall believe and be baptized shall be saved, but he that will not believe shall be damned. This promise is repeated again, when as the scripture calleth baptism the washing of the new birth and forgiveness of sins. After denying that the outward baptism washes away sins, why then doth the Holy Ghost call baptism the washing of the new birth and forgiveness of sins? God speaketh so not without great cause, to wit, not only to teach us that as the filth of our body is purged by water, so our sins also are purged by the blood and spirit of Christ, but much more to assure us by this divine token and pledge that we are as verily washed from our sins with the inward washing as we are washed by the outward and visible water. From Benjamin Keach's Gold Refined, we shall proceed to examine what baptism was ordained for by our Lord Jesus Christ, to hold forth or to be a sign or representation of. For like as in the holy sacrament of the supper, it behooveth us to know what the breaking of the bread and pouring forth of the vine signifies, or are figures of. So in like manner we ought, with as great care, to endeavor to know what is held forth, or represented to us as the holy sign of the blessed sacrament of baptism. Now then, this is that which we affirm, viz., 
that as the sacrament of the Lord's Supper was ordained to hold forth the breaking of Christ's body and the pouring forth of his blood, so in like manner the sacrament of baptism was instituted and appointed to hold forth Christ as really dead, buried, and that he arose again for our justification. And indeed, we cannot but be much affected with the great love and goodness of our blessed Savior in the initiation of these two great ordinances, it being his gracious design and condescension, hereby to hold forth, or preach, as I may say, to the very sight of our visible eyes by these fit and proper mediums, the glorious doctrine of his death, burial, and resurrection, which in the ministrations of the word is preached or held forth to the hearing of our ears, that so we might the better and more effectually be established and grounded in the sure and steadfast belief thereof, which is indeed absolutely necessary to salvation, as the apostle doth plainly testify. This being so, let none blame us for contending so earnestly for this ordinance according to the primitive purity, or its original glory, wherein, according to the gracious design of Jesus Christ, we daily receive, in beholding the administration of this sacrament, as well as in the Lord's Supper what is represented to us, such a blessed establishment in the truth of the doctrine of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, as well as in many other respects, the prophet and life appears to us. No ordinance being more significant or ordained upon more weighty and glorious purposes and designs. Thus all men may see how the learned agree with us that these scriptures do hold forth baptism to be a lively resemblance of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and not of the spiritual things signified only, viz., our mortification of sin and rising to holiness in a way of likeness to Christ's death and resurrection, but also the outward rite or form of administration of the sign itself. Dr. Jeremy Taylor, late Bishop of Down, in his plea for the Baptist, saith, This indeed is truly to be baptized, when it is both in the symbol and in the mystery. Whatsoever is less than this is but the symbol only, a mere ceremony, an opus operatum, a dead letter, an empty shadow, an instrument without an agent to manage or force to actuate it. Baptism was ordained to be a sign or figure unto the baptized of some inward spiritual grace, viz., of the person's death unto sin and vivification to a new life buried with him in baptism. It asked, Christ doth certainly expressly relate immediately, if not wholly, in those texts of Scripture to that outward sign itself, as that in which there is a plain representation of the mystery and inward grace. We are said to be buried and risen both in signification and also in lively representation of the inward and spiritual burial and resurrection with Christ. Secondly, here is mention made of the sign and of the thing signified. And as for that which is spoken of under this expression, buried in baptism, it is delivered as a medium, saith one, whereby as a motive whereunto, and a reason wherefore, as an image and representation, wherein we are both to read and remember, and also practice and perform that other. For do but mark, how shall we that are dead to sin, it is, should be, live any longer therein? Know ye not that as many of you as were baptized into Christ, it is into or in token of an interest in him, and of a oneness and fellowship with him by faith, are baptized into his death, it is in token of such a communion with the power of his death, as to kill sin and crucify the old man, so that henceforth we should not serve sin. Therefore hence it is, saith he, that in baptism, it is the outward sacrament, we are buried with him, it is outwardly, visibly, bodily in water, into his death. It is in token and resemblance of our dying unto sin by virtue of his death. That we should be ever practically mindful of this, that like as Christ rose again after he was dead, so we should rise to a new life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, it is signally in outward baptism, spiritually and really in the inward work of death unto sin, etc., performed by the Spirit upon the soul, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Thirdly, this burial and resurrection that is immediately expressed by these words, buried with him in baptism, wherein ye are also risen with him, is made a motive, argument, and incitement to the spiritual death and resurrection. For therefore are we persuaded to die to sin and live righteously, because in baptism we are buried in water and raised again, in token that we ought so to do. And to this end are we baptized and buried and raised therein, and so interested into all the other benefits of Christ's death, remission of sins, and salvation, viz., that we should die to sin and live holily, and to the end also that we may thereby be put in mind so to do.